QSD radio using an XMOS microcontroller. Quadrature sampling radio. Boy, it sounds really loud in my hearing aid. <laughs> okay. But two things happened. A little disclaimer here. Uh, the original goal was to have a working radio with this configuration to show you uh, the evil world of small business reared its head, and I didn't have time to do that. So I'm going to kind of sketch out what my plans were and still are, and also broaden what I'm going to talk about to some newer microcontrollers that are now available um, for very small prices and with all free software tools. So, in a way, I'm throwing down the gauntlet here. You can complete the radio I want to build. Uh, there's no reason you can't. So, obviously, the topic of microcomputers and use in ham radio is a pretty hot current topic. It's covered from QST from the April issue of this year. I put a question mark on that because if you've tried this, if you've tried programming microcontrollers and actually using them in something that requires accurate, real-time um, interactions, um, it's often not very easy. And you begin to dream about when you used your kid HW8 that had no computer and you had a lot of fun. Okay, so I put a question mark after that title. Um, so the, the basic, um, let's see if I can get, uh, there we go. This was an uh, issue from uh, last year, QST, and the reason I put this up here because a book on Python actually made the cover of QST. That really surprised me. Okay. But Python is a, not a new programming language, but it's having a resurgence in popularity uh, and in the academic and scientific worlds, there's a tremendous amount of activity in using Python. And the Python uh, software tools are free and open, and you can run them on any platform. You can run Python on your Android phone if you want to. Um, now, there's a specific reason for this talk that I put this up too, because there's now a way to run Python on a microcontroller. And I want to show you a little video about that in a minute. Um, but. Normal current model of software defined radio that most hams use is you have some detector that transforms your radio signal into an audio signal and then you plug that into your audio input on your PC. And people have written lots of software to display this very nicely and let you see a certain uh, spectrum over maybe, um, I don't know, what is it, five or 10 kilohertz or something, and, and you can see the different signals and click on the ones you wanna to listen to and with different modes of uh, demodulation. Uh, you can have a lot of fun with it. And, uh, but sometimes you find it's not so easy to set up all the software things. And you certainly can't very, I guess you could pick up your laptop and go to field day, but it's not a self-contained little radio like the HWA. Um, now, here's a commercial version of a software-defined radio. It still follows this model where you've got to plug it into a PC to display the information and control it. But for about $700, you get a lot of radio. 
Okay. And there's some very nice professionally written software to uh, control it and use it. Um, this radio uses direct digital sampling. It's got a very fast analog to digital converter in it. Uh, it's probably sampling at three or 400 megahertz. So if you want to work it at, say, up to 50 megahertz, you want to be sampling roughly an order of magnitude faster than that. It's like on a digital scope, so you can faithfully reproduce <coughs> the waveform. That's direct digital sample. Um, that's what it is. Now, the second example is about 10% the cost. You, know, you have to build a kit. And it's been around for a while. It's a soft, soft rock uh, quadrature sampling receiver transmitter. And this radio uses a chip that uh, Craig Johnson knows and loves, is the SI570 uh, frequency generator from Silicon Labs. And let's see what's on. I'll get you this in a second. But I don't want to explain quadrature sampling in detail, but if you can run, have a clock, a square wave clock running at about four times the frequency that you want to operate at, and you can use that to trigger some sample and hold amplifiers. So you sample the RF waveform at four different points, and then you take two of the points that are half a cycle away from each other, and you feed those two values into an op amp, different amplifier. You get a measurement of the amplitude of that RF, and then the other two points, which are moved over by 90 degrees in the cycle, you do that again. So if the first one happens to hit right on the, the peaks, you get a, a big voltage, and then the ones 90 degrees over hit right on the nose, and you get zero. Okay? It's just, uh, if the phase is a little bit different, those signals will vary. But you can take those samples, which, and then if you think of a uh, CW signal where you have just a constant amplitude fixed phase RF waveform, those samples would all be the same. And if you sit them, uh, while the, the RF was going positive and negative, these differences are the same positive value, and you run that through an RF filter, and you get a uh, constant output. If you take the RF that's been modulated with audio signal as an AM modulation, then as the waveform slowly varies at the audio frequency, the output of your your quadrature sampling detector is going to vary slowly with the audio frequency, and you'll have your audio information. Uh, it's an amazingly uh, sensitive detector. It's used in the NorCal kit that NC2040, or what was it called? They made them in five or six years ago. Uh, has a sensitivity uh, um, as good as probably the best receiver you can buy for thousands of dollars. And another surprising thing is the signal from the antenna goes directly to this detector. There's no amplification of the antenna signal. <coughs> and at first you wonder how can this detector be so sensitive? Well, 
at audio frequencies on order of a millisecond, you're doing this sampling, you know, if you're at, you're at 10 megahertz, you're doing this sampling 10,000 times in a millisecond. So you're, you're averaging like 10,000 samples. Um, so without any RF amplification, taking the signal straight through from your antenna, maybe through a passive filter, feeding into this detector, which the only oscillator is just a square wave clock. <coughs> you don't have to build a, a very high fidelity sine wave generator or something like that. You run it into your uh, high speed multiplexer to switch your op amps. And then essentially you have an audio signal that you feed into a high grade audio <coughs> which you can buy for a dollar or two. And you have a very sensitive, down to a tenth of a microvolt of the antenna type receiver. That's what the soft rock is. And pass this around. This is a 95% done soft rock board. Receiver's working. Try it out. You can take this, pass that around. Now it's hard to see the schematic here, but I'll just point out the major point. There's an 8 bit Atmel microcontroller on this board and it has a USB interface and all it's used for is to send a few numbers <coughs> to the Scilab's uh, square wave generator so and set its frequency. So if you want to operate at 7 megahertz, you set this to uh, 28 megahertz and then it controls the uh, multiplexer that's going to switch the antenna signal these two op amps here, and the audio will come out and you feed it into your PC, and you run one of the PC software programs, like you can use the same one from Plex Radio, uh, you can use that with the soft rock, uh, you can download it for free, and you can see your spectrum and the waterfall display and the whole thing. Okay. What I want to do was replace this 8-bit, very low-powered, in terms of computing performance, processor, and the PC with a single embedded microcontroller that has enough oomph to do the uh, DSP audio functions. And there's a fairly recent shift that's come out made by a British company called XMOS. If you're old and have gray hair, you might remember a British company called Inmos back in the 70s and 80s, and they made a thing called the Transputer, or whatever. There's some of that technology that's wandered off into this thing. These chips sell from started about three or four dollars. They run at 400 megahertz. They have up to, well, some of them have four, six, or eight individual 32-bit cores and you can control the timing of events between these cores down to about 10 nanoseconds. They're built for real-time multitasking. Um, they're programmed with a variation of the C programming language, and you can download the, uh, the software tools from XMOS for free. Um, I didn't bring a I'm going to be talking a bit about their start kit board, which you can buy from DigiKey for $15. Okay. This is another little XMOS starter kit, what, another development kit. I think it's $49. It's one of the early ones they had. This is the one I was thinking about plugging in this board <coughs> into the uh, soft rock. And then, or maybe uh, this board which is an XMOS development board, but also has a, a ADC and DAX for audio already on the board. I think that's maybe 150 or so. I don't know, 100. You can pass those around. So those are XMOS development boards. And so the idea is to unplug, just take the soft rock board and unplug that male tiny chip and unplug your PC and let the XMOS chip control the 
uh, Scilabs oscillator and then take the monitor audio signal that the, two, the in phase and um, quadrature phase audio signals and run them into the XMOS chip. Now, when you download the software tools for XMOS chip, you get a ton of examples that are already worked out in terms of audio processing, uh, many different functions. You just pick them out of a library and drop them into your program. So there's a lot there. They're trying to provide tools that let engineers who are developing electronics for cars or entertainment, you know, of Sony or somebody, can not have any software roadblocks between using these chips because they make their money by selling chips. They want to sell millions of these things. Well, the benefit for the hobbyist is that you get all these tools for free and you get the hardware for very little money. And you get something uh, that's really pretty cutting edge to play with. Okay. Um, so, this is the XML start kit for $15. And uh, if you go to DigiKey, you, know, you look at the data sheet, if you go to XMOS.com, all kind of videos and, and things to, to tell you about what this chip can do. But, lots of. Uh, well, let me back up for a minute. Okay. You had the 8-bit controllers that uh, I've used them in my work for over 10 years. We build different little lab instruments and we control things down to 10 nanoseconds also with stable timing. But we can't do anything with the data. We just pass it along. <coughs> That's about what the soft rock is doing. Uh, Craig used an 8-bit controller to, to, in his VFO to control that SI570 chip. But the, the controller is not really doing anything. It's just kind of setting things up. Then, so you move up to a, a more modern 32-bit controller, of which are out there both from PIC and uh, uh, Silicon Labs or uh, several different companies. But trying to do real-time programming with them, all right, it, it's tough. All right, you got to learn a lot. It takes a long time. Um, then this came along, and uh, when I first mentioned the Eshmos chip a couple of months ago, Craig was here, and, I, and, and, and he mumbled something about, oh, you got to have an operating system and all that. Well, well, that's just it. They've implemented real-time multitasking in this chip without an operating system. There's no operating system to get in the way. It's just running a C program with a few extra commands that they customize for their hardware. And they've got it so each of these individual cores that are uh, essentially running at about 100 megahertz can pass the data among themselves very efficiently and generate interrupts to trigger functions on different cores. And if eight cores is not enough for you, you can just take another chip and plug it in and you can just daisy chain these things. I don't know what the limit is on how many cores you can have. Probably 100. I mean, I don't know what to do with all that. Okay. So, where I'm trying to go is if you were here maybe sometime last year, I gave a little talk on phased arrays. What I want to make is a smart phased array. I want to bring the RF from several different antennas into this processor and real time control the relative phases so you can essentially steer the beam the way you want to or the way you, maybe the computer figures out to steer it to optimize the signal. Uh, that's much different. I mean, most phase rates you see, you put the coax together in some way for a fixed phase relationship, and there it sits. Um, 
with a chip like this, you could have a smart array. You could be bringing the, uh, not the audio, bringing the RF down from each antenna and feeding it into one of these things and let the computer figure out how to phase each signal to get the, the optimum uh, constructed interference. So that's what I find attractive about these things. Is that going to help eliminate some of the old phase controllers and uh, I hope so. And your feed lines having to oh, it's phase the top. specific the subject feed of feed lines. lines is talk for another day. Oh, okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure if this would calculate that but, and eliminate that. Well, I realized decision. later, I realized two things when I gave the, the talk on the little in-fed dipoles and having an array of those. Uh, at one point, you know, you had to put a ferrite uh, toroid on the on the feed line to cut to essentially terminate one end of it. And I had three different faces just frowning real big because what these guys knew was that as soon as you introduce that uh, core, you're very likely to get losses and reduce the efficiency of the antenna. So, and then the other thing is. In the real world, if you have all these antenna elements all strung together with a bunch of separate feed lines, you're going to be inducing currents in those feed lines, and you're not going to get the simple relationship between those elements that you, you think you will. So feed lines are a problem at best. And we'll talk about that today. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the, all this, uh, all this, uh, uh, all this kind of analog way of putting the f signals together when you, when you buy a ray controller. Yeah, I'd like to kind of do with that, do away with that. Uh, in my mind, you're getting away from the analog. I want to combine the digital processing of. of of the phase relationship and then all putting it in uh, computer. I mean, it seems like it would just be one more step to eliminate those complicated feed lines, phasing feed lines. But all right, I, 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 I'll, make, I'll say one sentence about that. Do away with feed lines well, not <laughs> and let each antenna have its own little transceiver. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is that enough? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, there's no way I can go in and talk about detail about how to program this thing, whatever I'm still learning myself, okay? But it's out there for just a few bucks. You can get one. You can download all the software on your Linux or Windows PC. And you can play with it. Um, now, what I realized when I was going into this is that, yeah, this is, this is good and it's really unique the way they've got these multiple cores and you could have each core working on the, you know, part of the multi-phase array or all that. But in just terms of learning about programming computers or, um, or Maybe you know taking this the detector like the soft rock and, and, and uh, doing processing on the audio signals. We could look at a couple other types of processors, and one that recently just got funded on Kickstarter is, and that's why the Python picture was up there. There's a fellow in England. His name is Damien George. Uh, he happens to be a physicist, but. Uh, I'm going to show you a little video from him in a minute, and you'll realize that he's more of one of these all-around guys. I mean, he can do the theoretical stuff, but he can handle a soldering iron, too. And he came up with the idea of, look, I've been programming these microcontrollers to build little robots and things and programming them in assembler, and it's just too hard. And he does a lot of Python programming on PCs. So essentially, you want to put Python on a microcontroller. Well, I'm going, to, I'm going to let him tell you about it. 
But before I do, if I had to pick one programming language to learn, if I wanted to get into programming computers today, I would pick Python. And for the simple reason, you can do very simple things with it. It'll remind you of quick basic from the old days. I mean, you can bring up a Python uh, window and type in one plus one and hit the enter key and it says two. And but you can also do object-oriented programming. You know? And then people say, oh, Python's slow because it's a scripted language. <coughs> well, what you can do when there's any numerically intensive work to do, you bring in a, a library, a DLL, that's been written in C or uh, some other language that's been optimized for performance, and you just call it from Python. And there's just tons of this stuff out there. Tons of it. But, if you want a quick introduction to Python, I would retitle this book Python for Kids and Big Kids. Okay? Because it starts off really simple, but by the end of this little book, you understand object-oriented programming in the sense of a modern programming language. This is worth getting. Um, so, that's the Python language. And I want to run a little video, I think it's about five minutes, it's called Damien George in England, that was hit the video he used for his Kickstarter project. And he wound up raising like 97,000 pounds. And he's, so he's got this little microcontroller board that can run Python. And like well over a thousand people, including myself, backed him. And now he's making two or three thousand of these little boards, and I expect to get mine in a couple of weeks. This board is powerful enough to process uh, an audio signal. It's a 168 megahertz, 32-bit computer with floating point hardware. It's an ARM M3 core or something. So let me see if I can get this up here. Um, Plug in my speaker so you can hear him. If you don't think he has a real English accent, it's because he's from Australia. Quite <laughs> 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 right, mate. <clears throat> uh, it's taking a second for this one to come up. I don't know why it takes so long.
board measures 40 by 33 millimeters, has an ARM CPU, USB connector, buttons, LEDs, and a micro SD card slot. Also, a three axis accelerometer, voltage regulator, and 30 input output pins. These features on their own can already be used for many different things, such as logging data and controlling servo motors. You can connect the board to many existing devices, or even design your own board and put MicroPython on it. MicroPython can run with or without a PC. When connected to a PC via a USB cable, it acts just like a USB flash drive. You can copy your Python scripts across as you normally would, and when the board reboots, it runs them. Programming for MicroPython requires no software except a text editor. Any text editor will do, and works on Linux, Windows, and Mac without any setup. A simple thing you can do is to use the accelerometer to log the motion of the board to a file. With this Python script, the board will write to a file the X, Y, and Z values of the accelerometer, and the output will look something like this. MicroPython also acts as a USB serial device, giving you a standard Python command line running directly on the board. You simply open up a terminal emulator and start typing Python commands straight to the board. This is a great way to test your ideas and debug your code. Here we are running Conway's Game of Life, written in Python and drawing to the connected LCD display. Due to the efficient use of memory in MicroPython, in this example no heat memory is allocated and no garbage collection needs to run. Here we load a bitmap from the onboard flash file system and draw it to the LCD in real time. hardware floating point, and here we are using Python's complex numbers to generate the Mandelbrot fractal. Here we have a small robot, and we are using two of the accelerometer axes to control the robot's servo motors. There is no connection to a PC. Here we have the MicroPython board connected to a Bluetooth module battery and two servo motors. We can connect over the serial Bluetooth device and have a remote Python command line. The MicroPython board can also act as a USB mouse and even a keyboard. This is selectable in the configuration file which runs on boot up. Python functions can be called on an interrupt. Here we are generating a sound signal using the digital to analog converter and amplifying it into a speaker. Full details on the MicroPython compiler how the inline assembler works can be found in the project description. Through Kickstarter, I wanted to share with you my passion for robotics and programming. I thought many of you would be excited to be part of the development of MicroPython and also own a MicroPython board. MicroPython is currently running very well, but there is still some work to do. With your support and involvement, I can continue to develop MicroPython, extend its functionality, and make it free open source software. I need enough people to pledge for a MicroPython board so I can do a small manufacturing run here in the UK. I will also make the board open hardware. So, come on Kickstarter, get behind MicroPython, get yourself a MicroPython board, and be among the first to experiment with the smallest Python ever made. Thanks for watching. <coughs> All right, well, that's how you make a successful Kickstarter video. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Now, I have to mention... I have to mention that processor and its free software tool, which puts you in the world of Python. I thought I'd show you one more. And if you don't think the XMOS chip has enough muscle, this one's got more. And um, so, I thought I had a picture. Oh, there it is. Okay. The flex radio with this direct digital sampling is able to process all that data because they've got FPGA chips in there, field programmable gate arrays, where you can program these dedicated logic circuits 
if you spend a career learning how, <laughs> to process data really fast. Okay, and that's what is behind a lot of your cell phones and your video equipment. It's, it's FPGA chips. <coughs> well, there are now chips out there where they take one little corner of their FPGA array and they program it to be a microcontroller. And then it's interfaced with the rest of the FPGA logic that's available. And this one is called Zybo. Uh -huh. Digilent is a company that makes development tools for 32-bit uh, microcontrollers and then chips here like this now. And this board is uh, $189, it looks like. That's for the development board. The chip, of course, is maybe $10 or $15 or something. Um, but what's on this, in the chip, not the board, what's on the chip? A dual core 650 megahertz Cortex A9 processor. That's a lot of processors. Okay, that's like a PC. Um, a bunch of memory controller for a bunch of RAM, uh, one gigabyte bit Ethernet, USB. And then it also has the PGA arrays on that chip that you can program and control with the A9 cores. So this thing's just, its purpose for being is real-time digital <coughs> signal process. And, oh, let's see, where's, well, I guess I had, somewhere there's supposed to be, a, <laughs> if you go look for this thing, all the software development tools are free. Okay. It's probably, and my guess is it's programmed in C, and then uh, they have programming tools for the FPGA. Now, I've always been a little afraid of FPGA programming because it's not easy. And there's one other board I want to mention that um, besides these, that this is something. Some guy made something called a free SOC system on a chip. And what a lot of the FPGA companies are doing now is they're, they're making more chips like this one, trying to integrate things more onto the chip and trying to make the programming tools easier so more people can use them. And uh, it kind of becomes a, a graphical thing. You can have a certain function you need in your hardware and you can click on it in some library and just drag it into your, I want to say circuit, but your project. And um, this is a, this is a, some project that a fellow put together to have this little development board and I'll pass it around. It's got his, his free SOC.net. Uh, it doesn't cost very much. It has a, uh, one of these system on a chip parts on there that you can download the programming tools for. And all that. So, I mean, there, there's many choices. And that's why uh, I don't know that my first choice, the XMOS chip, is really the best choice. I thought there's at least uh, <coughs> there's four different options here. Um, how could you take something like a soft draw? And turn it into a standalone uh, software defined radio that uh, can, you know, this is it's right up there with the best flex radios and, and the other uh, software defined radios. So, pass that one out. Sure. So, that's about it. Um, I don't have a piece of hardware to show you today, and I apologize for that. But, there's some ideas. Uh, 
and uh, I expect next month for there to be several pieces of hardware here that I can touch. <laughs> Question? Yeah. I think I missed the very last two sentences that you were saying. There's something about comparing a hard rock block to the very best flex radios. Well, yeah, I kind of mumbled through that. I think with these processors and a, 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 a basic circuit like the soft rock for your detector, you can build a radio as, anything, as good as anything out there. Like the flex radios cost $700,000, things like that? Yeah. I mean, that's quite a price difference. <laughs> You can use the Flex Radio software to on your PC. You can use it with the software. But why? I, you buy a, a Flex Radio. You got to have a PC to plug it into, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. This is trying to. If you want to take one of these little boards and put them in the same box as your soft rock, and that's your that's your station. That's your radio. You don't need a PC. Okay. You get enough processing power in an embedded chip now that you don't need the PC. And you don't need the operating system. Yeah. You don't need a Raspberry Pi. Mm -hmm. And try to do... You don't need it. <laughs> you see the January issue of QST uh, this year, one of the articles talked about a, a little uh, USB, it looked like a uh, USB stick. Yeah. They had an antenna connection in the end. It was used for, I think, television, but um, it was broad enough spectrum that you could use it for a whole lot more things. And they had repurposed it to uh, ADSB on uh, aircraft. Have you uh, done or seen anything with those? I haven't played with one of those. I have not played with one of those, but yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a receiver that has a tremendous bandwidth, and you can program it to ham radio applications if you want. That's about all I know of. Um, the, um, yeah, a lot, a lot of tools out there. Can, can you work backwards on your spot uh, phase array system where you sense the field kind of in real time and use the more of a control system to more precisely know where your beam is actually going? Um, yeah, I, I tell you, I tell you what the dream is. Okay, <laughs> I hate seeing all this stuff. And I can't really show you something that's working, but you know how you now have your waterfall display. Well, if you had your phased array, of, you know, I don't know. Say you got nine verticals out there or something, right? If you could process all these in real time, you should essentially have a display on your, on your screen where this is uh, just an angular map of the, the sky. It shows you where your, your signal is coming from. Mm -hmm. right. Which part, I mean, if you can see the radio signal, and which way you know, If some guy in Chicago is talking to me, I would, yeah, that's right. I would see that bit of the sky lining up, right? Oh. Okay. And that's what this can see. <laughs> if you could, but you have to, you got to work at the RL. I mean, by the time the audio is gone, right? Yeah. Okay. So, you essentially want something that's, that's bringing all these RF signals into a box and you measure the phase of all these signals relative to some master clock and then put them all together. And I think an XMOS chip could do it, and certainly this Zybo thing could do it. Uh, so, so you have a steerable beam with some dB of gain that has no mechanical limitations, so you could Yeah, you could scan. instantly. It's just like with a radar phased array. Right. Yeah. 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 And how much? Bring up a picture of the Duga three. The what? Duga D-U-G-A three. Type that in. You get an antenna like that with a phased array receiver on it. You can instantly 
move from one point to the other. Right. But this techniques would let you do that what easier and cheaper than the delayed lines and yeah. analog techniques. No feed line. Well, feed lines all have to be equal in the antennas. No feed line. They eliminate the feed line. Under a thousand dollar kind of that's why you make this process. process. I don't know. I think I phased arrays. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. cool. It's just these are just things that these chips make possible. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm saying. And these chips and the software tools are cheap, cheap, cheap. It strikes me a little bit like a like an Arduino, but sort of everything is amped up by a couple orders of magnitude. Exactly. And then um, and it's there now. Eight cores. 10 nanosecond intercommunication. Yeah, try to do this with Arduino. Yeah, no, no, there's, there's gonna happen. there are a couple decades. <laughs> now, do these, the boards that you've got, do they have, um, like what kind of resolution ABCs do they have available for those? The, on the board? simplest board has no ABC. Okay. And the, oh, the ones that do were for audio frequency. Okay. That's where the quadrature sampling detector <coughs> comes in. Okay. That thing works at RF, and you don't have to have an ABC that's working at a gigahertz or something. You have some little multiplexer that works at 100 megahertz or something like that that you buy for four or five dollars. That's the that's that's why I passed around the software. So the radios, the radio part, in my mind, is a quadrature sampling detector. And all, once you, by the time you get to the audio, you're just working with a regular audio codec or, or, or equivalent of that. But not, not like Flex Radio does with direct digital sampling. It is. Right, but you still, I mean, if you want, if you want bandwidth, you still need a significant resolution. On your well, ABC bandwidth, is. what, 100 kilohertz or something? I mean, that's not. Well. Well, 100 kilohertz would be. You mean for the audio or the RF? Well, I mean when you're sampling, like if you have, all right, what is it, a 48 kilohertz uh, is the normal soft drop, right? And don't you need like a, at least 16 bit to sample that? What is the? Well, yeah, but, <coughs> but that's but that's audio things, uh, and you can buy high quality audio. Uh, and ADC. No, I, well, I, th I thought you were trying to get away from your, so that would be something you would add on to this board to get away from the PC and the... That, and the, the audio part would be done by the microcontroller. That's the easy part. So the audio, you're saying that the microcontroller, you would do it without an ADC? No, you got to convert the analog to digital, but getting but getting a hundred ninety two kilohertz twenty four bit audio ADC is not a problem. But you would have to add it to this board. I'm I'm not following something here. Well, there's one board there that has audio hardware on it. There's one that doesn't, mm -hmm. and I don't know the quality of the audio that's on that particular board. But adding it. Is not expensive, right? Okay. Well, yeah, it's, I'm assuming it's not expensive, but but it would be something. It's this isn't something you could just plug in instead of your PC. Well, actually, if you take if you take the soft rock and you plug it into this X small starter board that does have audio on it, I mean. Sony just went with the XMOS chip for their highest end audio equipment. And there's a little video about it on the XMOS site. So, it's good enough for Sony, it's good enough for me, I guess what I'm saying. <laughs> this thing is capable of doing high end audio. Right, okay. But some of the boards have it, some of them don't. It That's right. The starter kit contact. has no analog on the board, but it has a little slot they call a. a Slice, for, you know, they call these little add-on boards slices or something, and it's got a little socket you can plug.
plug in audio slots that's equivalent to this audio on this board. So maybe it's fifteen dollars for the for the uh, starter kit and twenty or something for the audio slots. I don't I don't know what's wrong. But yeah, you have to you'd add that to the starter kit. But the but programs to use that audio hardware come with the with the, the integrated development button. Uh, I'm not saying it's trivial to start using this thing. I mean, you have to study it and get used to their tools. But it's very capable, and the bits and pieces are cheap. Enough for me. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thank you.